life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details, and survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Three, two, one. I, I, I think I need a clapperboard. <laughs> I have a little... Actually, I have a real one somewhere. Oh, cool. We could totally use that. Mark it! <laughs> Hi, I'm Marshall. I'm Lainey. And I'm Corey. And there's some dead up in here. We are now moving on to episode two of season one, Guts. Which is a very apparent why it is called this. <laughs> yeah. Later on. <laughs> because somebody's got guts. So we're hoping that this episode is not as long as episode one, because we don't have to deal with a lot of the beginning stuff, but... There is some interesting things we're going to talk about in this episode as we continue to meet all these people from the Atlanta Survivor Camp, basically. Mm -hmm. When we start the episode, we are in the Atlanta Survivor Camp, and we are meeting some people there. So I'm going to tell you right now who is there in total, not who is there as we start this episode. Yeah. Body count, pre-body count. So we yeah. know who our, who our group is, even if they aren't in the shot. Right. So yeah. Daryl Dixon, who is not really in the shot because he's off hunting at this point. We have Ed, Carol, and Sophia Pelletier. We have Lori and Carl Grimes. We have Morales, which I don't know if they ever really say his first name, with his family, Miranda, Luis, and Eliza. Mm -hmm. We have Glenn Marie, Andrea, and Amy, T-Dog, Shane Walsh, Dale Horvath, Jackie, Jim, and 12 to 13 unnamed survivors. There's still some debate about how many are just hanging out in the camp there. Uh huh. And then we also have Merle, who is currently in Atlanta with everybody else. But we'll, we'll get there. We'll yeah, get we there. never really see him at the camp at the, in this right. episode. Right, no, we're, he's never there. Yeah. So, But he is technically part of the Atlanta survivor mm -hmm. camp because he is Joe's brother. And I don't know if they fully get into this in a later episode, but it, it's actually Dale that brought them all together in the right. first place because he's got this RV and all this camping equipment. And I think we will get into why later, but mm -hmm. he finds all these people, rescues them and brings them there. And they're using his equipment to survive out there. Mm -hmm. And while we're on the subject, the actor that plays Dale, he has a strong relationship with Frank Darabont. He was not only in Shawshank Redemption, but he was also in the green mile Mm, right. yeah. Two of Stephen King's adaptations that we mentioned in the last episode that are connected to Frank Darabont because he directed both of those movies. It's nice to see sometimes when, even if they don't have a full repertory company, directors bring their early actors along that they've worked with mm -hmm. to other projects. So. Right. Yeah, his name is Jeffrey DeMunn. There you go. Oh, there you go. So, Marshall, do you have anything about survivalism? You have Amy. They, they all kind of make fun of her as the mushroom queen. She comes up to Lori, and she's got a bucket full of mushrooms she found. And she's like, I don't know if any of these are actually edible. Do you? And Lori's like, take it to Shane, because Shane knows these things, I guess. There is actually a way to tell if a piece of plant matter that you find is poisonous. And you can do this by yourself, uh, although doing it as a group is probably going to be a little easier. So what you do, first off, if it smells bad, don't eat it. <laughs> That's the first thing that you need. Then you're going to take the plant apart and separate it out in all of its various different parts because sometimes a plant's leaves will be poisonous, but its fruit or its stems or its roots will actually be beneficial. Mm, gotcha. So then you take each individual part and you rub it against your inner elbow or against your wrist for a few minutes and then wait for about 15 minutes. And if you start to feel a burning or an itching or you have a rash or it goes numb, don't eat it. Then after that, go ahead and prepare the plant however you want. But don't actually try and like, okay, now it's cooked. I'm going to go chomp it down. You want to press it against your lips for a little bit and see if you get any of those same kinds of effects. It's basically... You're using your skin to test and see if it's going to give you an allergic reaction. Then you're going to test it against your lips to see if it has any reaction to your bloodstream. Because uh, your lips right. and your, your mouth is very close to your bloodstream. 
Also, if this tastes bitter or soapy, then just spit it out. So do test thoroughly because you want to make sure that you're, you're getting each individual part and know what each part is going to do. So I'm guessing so, this is going to take a long time if you have a lot of different things that yes, you have to test. Yes, yep. Marshall, you've dealt with good mushrooms. You've dealt with poisonous mushrooms. You didn't really address hallucinogenic mushrooms. You're going to learn that very quickly if you use this method. Because if you put that thing to your lips and you've cooked it, more than likely you're going to start to feel a little weird. Maybe. Maybe. And you might just be like the guy that would wear free hug day to a zombie horde. Alternately, you could get the really wrong mushrooms and be like, we can't go there. It's dead country. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's some field toxicology for you. It isn't absolutely perfect, but it filters out the worst of the worst. Right. So Lori takes these mushrooms to Shane. She is yeah, going under the up guise, to, under, under the, the guise, guise of, yeah. of saying, "Hey, yeah, let's go take these to Shane." When in reality, they're just going to go hook up in the woods. So I have a couple problems with this. Not <laughs> yeah. to mention the fact that Shane is like a creepy little predator dude right now, but the fact that they are having sex in the woods where zombies could happen upon them. Anyone else like totally turned on by this scenario? I am no? not. Mm-mm. No, me no. neither. Nope. Well, I think the the fact that they do this is definitely number one. Shane it, Shane really instigates it, even yeah. though she might come out and do her little coy mushroom bit. Right. But that's testament to Shane's confidence that no matter what, he's going to survive. Huh. Yeah. Let's go over to Atlanta for a little while. Yes, Rick please. is where we left him in that tank. Glenn is with him on the radio, and I noticed that this is where we hear Glenn call them geeks and not walkers and uh, quite a few people in the atlanta survivor camp do call them geeks did i've heard them call rotters in this scene from the atlanta survivor group. okay gotcha. i've heard what? them call i heard some of them call them rotters while while they're in the tank i made a note of the fact that rick says to glenn he has 16 shots in the clip for his beretta so i started counting how many gunshots he actually did just to see if there was a discrepancy. And what he did was he uses 11 on the walkers before he meets Glenn in the alley. Then when he starts climbing up the ladder, he uses three more and he has two shots left and then he puts it in Glenn's backpack. So technically, yes, everything was a-okay in the amount of bullets. Yeah. The amount of the bullets ammo count. versus... Yeah. If you haven't told yet, like deducted already, Lainey is the continuity queen. (laughs) She will always pick out errors in continuity in movies and TV. So then Glenn takes Rick up to meet with the rest of the scavengers from the Atlanta camp and does his favorite quote from this episode, which is, Nice moves there, Clint Eastwood. You're the new sheriff. Come riding in to clean up the town. Yes. That's not his only nickname that he gets this episode Uh, anyway so he goes and introduces rick to andrea morales jackie t-dog glenn and merle and at this point they start to establish really strong character personality traits like these are characters that with maybe the exception of morales you remember Mm -hmm. the whole series right yeah so you get andrea who I kind of remember as being a bit of a crybaby for like the first season or two. Anyone? Yeah. I don't know if you guys remember. Yeah, this? we. She wasn't necessarily one of my favorite characters, although she wasn't the majestic, directed by Frank Darabont. Truth. But yeah, I I just kind of always felt she was a whiny character, always kind of like about her sister's fate, mm-hmm. and that just made her a turn off to me like yeah. I didn't even when she started to make a turnaround it didn't turn around enough so I think we're gonna start tracking that like how many times she cries <laughs> so the first time she cries is when Rick comes in and she's like oh my gosh you have all the rockers coming to us we're gonna die That's so the, the official time. branding is now Andrea's wine watch right oh yes and then we also have Merle who is racist little bigot right from the get-go what I did notice is that, that the casting person bravo to you there is a really diverse group of people on this roof. We've got a couple African-American people. We've got a Hispanic man. We've got an Asian man. I mean, I, it kind of struck me as the fact that they didn't just go, you know, one way or the other like they could have. They really made it be this group of people that were very diverse in their backgrounds. That and were it's together. the South. 
and in yeah. the South. Exactly. So because the South is not just black and whites. There are people from all over and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, of course, well, let's talk about Morales. So we'll talk about him again in season eight. But I had totally forgotten about this dude. Like, really forgotten yeah. about this dude. But the, as we've been watching it, I have realized that he actually plays some very important but minor parts in this series. So, you know, he is in this scene, but we're going to see him later on in season eight in the episodes Damned and Monsters as he is part of the Savior compound with Negan. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting, which I totally forgot about. Yeah. And the last thing is... Merle is just going off whatever, and he's he says to Rick, "Who are you?" And Rick says, "I'm Officer Friendly." Yep. <laughs> yeah. The and jokes. I I also like I completely forgot about Jackie after all these years, but seeing her again, she is really awesome. Actually, right now, right now, like the parts that I've seen her in so far, she's just been really strong, really powerful, not really taking any crap. We get to this part where Merle is trying to take leadership of the scouting party and everybody is being forced to raise their hands and she raises her hand with a middle finger. And I'm like, yes, mm-hmm. that, yeah, that's what he deserves. When we get I'll, to the end yeah. of this season, I, I, I think we're going to circle back around and talk about how we leave her because yeah. I don't necessarily agree with the method Based on the type of person that she is through this season. Yeah. So we'll talk about that. So now the group is trying to find their way out of the building. As they're trying to scout their way out, Rick and Glenn are up on the top of the roof and they, and they see a truck. And there's this whole like construction camp. And the construction company says... Frank. Frank. Yeah. So Frank Builders, the Frank it refers to is the original series showrunner Frank Darabont. Uh, Frank is the name he was given when he was born in a French refugee camp in 1959. Oh. So that is the truck that they will later take and we'll make a note of it when they drive back to the Atlanta camp. They take this truck with this name on it. Take us home, Frank. Glenn ends up taking Morales to the sewers, and then Andrea and Rick go back into the store area, and T-Dog gets to stay on the roof with Merle. Probably some poor planning there, just saying. I, yeah, putting, but I think they put T-Dog with Merle because he got beat up by Merle, so he's not doing well either. So they put the two guys on the roof who were, one was handcuffed and one was not feeling great. That's what they ended yeah. up doing. Yeah. We took a note last week that when the gas ran out in Rick's car and he starts off on foot to go to the farmhouse, he took the picture of his family and put it into his coat, into his shirt. So he has a picture of his family there. And he and Andrea are talking about people they left behind, etc, etc. And it was the perfect time for him to bring that picture out and be like, this is my family. So Andrea could have been like, I know those people. Yeah. But that never happened. And I feel like, why did you even give him this picture to put in his shirt if you're not going to use it? Or even just not have her say those things at that time. Right. Just know it. That's an easier fix because you definitely want that reuniting thing happen. You Mm -hmm. want that. That moment's more important than him pulling out. Or like something happens where it like breaks off her train of thought and then like she forgets. Yeah, or he's about to pull it out and then the zombies. I felt like this was just a missed opportunity, but whatever. In that same scene... We have the smart walkers. Yes. And so, yeah, we, we talked last time that there's smart walkers, but there is one in here. He is a gung-ho walker. He comes in, and he's got a big old cinder block that he's using to smash through the glass doors. Mm-hmm. And then in a later shot, we see him again, and he's dropped it, and he is now pounding on the glass, but he has this look of insane rage. Yeah, he was, he was very, like adamant about using that brick and i was like smart yeah they all figure out there's no way to get out so they go back to the store and they disguise themselves with guts that's why now this is another thing that uh, i think we need to keep track of and that is my axe they've they've said in later episodes that the fire axe that that rick wields is symbolic of authority and this is the very first time that we see him pick up the fire axe and use it. Yeah, he kind of passes it around, but it does end up being his one of his two signature weapons. Mm-hmm. 
And this is also the first symbolic time that he wields the axe as he goes, this is my plan to get us through and execute. This is my authority. Yeah, and they, I mean, that's the interesting thing that wood handled objects because, you know, Negan, his bat, you know, this whole thing of having that totem of authority mm-hmm. is a thing on this show. When Rick is down with Andrea in the store area, mm-hmm. so they decide that they're going to walk through the to the horde with disguised as a walker, putting the guts all over yourself. This is something that is not used until much later down the line in a, in a few seasons even again. Although yeah. it is used a lot in Fear the Walking Dead. It's pretty amazing that they they figured this out this early on. Yes. That's just something that any other show would have waited or not thought of exactly. much later. And it's really something that only works this early in the apocalypse. Because I, I would say that unless there's something going on in these this virus that's making people be like this that keeps your nose working, that thing's going to rot out. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to be able to smell for too much longer. Yeah. So there is some, um, especially if you look in the Survival Guide to Zombie Apocalypse by Max Brooks, his version of zombies actually have heightened senses of smell, and they keep that. Mm, Interesting. One of the things I also find funny is that in the first episode, when Rick leaves Morgan's house, he has found PPE, right? He has his visor. He finds another one in the store. It seems to be like at least this season his go-to face protection is this visor which fits being a law enforcement officer you would always like i'm sure it does to have that. yeah so this guy that they've decided to cut up is one of the zombies that they have shot outside the building and they drag him back inside from the alley and they give him a little mini eulogy so i'm gonna read that kind of his name is wayne dunlop he is born in 1979 with 28 in his pocket and a picture of a pretty girl named rachel Oh, and as Glenn points out, he's an organ donor. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, of course Glenn would point that out. <laughs> One thing Rick says is not to get any on their skin. I find this really weird because, and obviously this was pre-Fear the Walking Dead. Fear the Walking Dead has this stuff all over their face. Yeah. It's on their arms. It's all over their skin. So I think, especially after season one, there's a big shift in, you know, the ideology of of what the blood can actually do to you. In season one, I think it was just a lot more like, we're going to have him do this and see where it goes. I think it's also because he is kind of seeing what's going on. He isn't sure what the blood can do. And that's Mm -hmm. why he's like, "Uh uh-uh. Don't even get the blood on you. Right. Well, he's public safety officer again, like you said with the PPE. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's pro- he might have been through some kind of viral infection. It might have Maybe. swept through. And let's face it, we'll get to it later. But the CDC is in Atlanta, so they mm. might have had some kind of training. Even True. though he's from a smaller town, he might have had that. And to err on the side of caution mm. would be what a sheriff would do. Also, Andrea's crying again. Of yeah. course, wine watch. <laughs> Uh, she's like, I can't believe we're going to do this and get this guy and wear this stuff. Well, she's not. But We need but, to start getting timestamps for the white watches. I might. And the last thing I wanted to bring up is that the things that they have decided to put on Glenn and Rick is intestines and feet. Yes. Which actually reminds me of Superstore a little bit. There's this whole line, um, oh. Eric, in Superstore about how they keep finding these feet feet that don't belong to any of the bodies. They can't find the bodies, but the feet. Yes, you do find out who does it in the last episode. I don't know why. It just made me think of it. <laughs> these these feet. But didn't they only chop up like one body, but they each had two feet? Yeah. I know there were two people they shot in the alley, so maybe that was it. Who knows? Yeah. It was one of those things that got cut and then right, didn't right. make sense. So let's go back to the camp. And Dale is fixing that RV, and the other people are kind of doing different things around the camp. And I do have to bring up that Carl is like little baby Carl. So cute. Baby Carl. It's so weird seeing him now after seeing him at the end of the series. And Mm -hmm. he's like practically an adult at the end of the series. And it's just like, I grew up with this kid. Yeah, well, yeah. This is Carl pre-pudding. Right. So T-Dog is trying to radio to the camp. 
But the message is kind of getting interfered, but he, they can at least make out that they are surrounded and they're trying to get out of the mm-hmm. building. Amy is super ticked at Shane because he's like, we're not going to go get her. And she's like, that's my sister. You, We're going to go get him. Well, you know, what do you expect? Number one, Shane uh, left his best friend to die. Yeah. He doesn't care about your sister, Amy. Yeah. But not that Amy knows this, but we do, right? Yeah. And he's... When you're thinking tactically, yeah, they're in the middle of the worst of the worst. You can't sacrifice more people to go get them. You kind of can, but he doesn't want to. You would also have to have a better vehicle than they have. Yeah. Because you want to maintain the RV, you know, for for necessity, with something you need it for, you know, even for shelter if you need it. Mm-hmm. If they had that big a truck or something like that that they could... You know, say if they had a Ford F-150, not not sponsored, something like that, absolutely bust through, knock zombies down, get people to jump in the back, for sure. But they don't have that kind of equipment. Yeah. So as much as we don't like Shane, he's not wrong here. And, you know, is it Amy, the sister? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Wine Watch Part 2. It's just a family thing. Apparently. <laughs> so now we're back to Rick and Glenn on the street on their way to the construction area. I think it's really funny that one of the zombies like kind of comes up to Glenn and Glenn's like, and the, <laughs> and the zombie goes, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> bye-bye. Cool Ready? story, bro. All right. <laughs> you mad, bro? <laughs> so then it starts to rain and they start to lose all of their zombie guts all over their body. And I'm, I'm actually going to call somebody on this one because the rain would also start to take the smells in the area and grab onto it as it's coming down, which means these zombies would not instantly be like, oh, you're just faking it. Yeah, exactly. I thought the same thing. I was like, what? Yeah, it's like Schmeyance, like they say on The Flash. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we have another super smart zombie who decides he's going to try to climb the fence in order to get at Glenn and Rick. Yeah, a couple of zombies are actually trying to climb the fence. And I'm like, what is happening with these guys? They're dexterous and everything. It's not just like a piece of concrete at a door. It'd be it's... funny if he was like some athlete before he was turned into <laughs> yeah. zombie. And like it's all just muscle memory that's causing him to like... He's right. like a, a gymnast or something like that. Pole vaulter. So then they get the construction truck and they also pick up a Dodge Charger where they set off the alarm so that Glenn can lead the zombies away. Now this Dodge Challenger that Glenn drives is actually the exact same make and model as the one that Walter White buys for his son on AMC's Breaking Bad. Now something that I ran into in my research for The Walking Dead is that a lot of people think that AMC created this kind of in the same universe because you're going to see a lot of things that are related. So this is one of them. I have not watched Breaking Bad, but Corey has. So blue meth started the zombie apocalypse. (laughs) Yeah, that's the theory. Um, That comes later. (laughs) I did find it. So tell me about this challenger that Walter White... Well, Walter White, so he's a chemistry teacher turned drug kingpin kind of in a way. When he starts making some extra money, he's mainly making the money for his cancer treatment because his family can't afford it. But he decides to splurge and buy his son a car, Mm -hmm. which tips the wife off. So where are you getting this money? So it's kind of like where he's on that uneasy balance of like revealing too much of himself. And that was basically what happened. So. So then Rick picks up the rest of the group at the store. Unfortunately, Merle gets left up on the roof because T-Dog trips and drops the key down a drain. But T-Dog does have second thoughts after going out the door and decides he's going to chain link it so the zombies cannot get to Merle. So at least he feels bad. But as we all know, if you've ever seen Hangover, being on a roof equals dehydration and it's sun exposure. So that is a problem for Merle. And I think we really do get to see those effects on him when we get into seeing him again. Yeah, exactly. and also just a thing to like say about Merle is as much as he's hated as Shane can be, but much more so, he mm-hmm. is trained to hunt, trained all that stuff. So he's got all that survival training as well. Mm-hmm. So he would know that about what Laney said about being on the roof, that... This is a bad situation, and he needs to get out. So Right, exactly. So then everyone decides to drive to camp, and Glenn is, like, you know, whooping and hollering his way down that freeway because he's going so fast. He's got a brand new car, baby. He does, and the song that is playing 
is I'm a man by the who. So here's a couple lyrics from that song. When now, when I was a little boy about the age of five, I had something in my pocket, keep a lot of folks alive. Now I'm a man, I'm age 21. You know, baby, we can have a lot of fun. I'm a man, I spell M-A-N, man. So how do you think that connects to what Glenn is doing at this moment when he's driving the car? Well, let's put it this way. Could he afford that car on his current job as a pizza guy? Probably not. No. So in, it's a young man. Let's say he's in his early 20s, I would assume, something like that. Young man in his early 20s, and the zombie apocalypse happens. It's terrible, but he's also Mr. Go-To. So he's got a little bit of status because he can get in. He's kind of like the grease man, like they have in Ocean's Eleven. But... He all of a sudden gets a bonus of driving a Dodge Challenger. What mm-hmm. would any hot-blooded young man do? I mean, it fits that moment of like, yes, I get to drive this car that I would never be able to afford with, you know, free zombie attack. And so. with that highway the way that it currently is, where one side of it's completely empty, you can really let that engine rip mm-hmm. and see just how fast you can go. Which is why he got to the camp before the other truck. <laughs> yeah, and everyone well was like, where are they? they? <laughs> yeah. And it seems like he's he gets there like hours ahead of them. He's like, oh, my bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. So let's go into number one. Who was killed? Not a lot of people. Actual people were mm-hmm. killed. But we can do an RIP to Wayne Dunlap yes. for... Donating his guts. Yes, thank you for sac- your sacrifice. Okay. Let's talk about the comic. From page 42 to page 48 is what takes place during this episode. Now, what's really interesting is in the comics, they never, I mean, they, Glenn and Rick never meet up with the scavenger group while they're in Atlanta. Glenn just leads Rick back to the survivor camp. There's really nothing in the the thing that takes place in this episode, except for maybe a little exposition and the fact that Glenn is wearing a baseball cap, which is also what he's wearing in the show. So that's kind of all there is. Now you started to read the comics as well, right? Yes, I did. And you know, we got a little bit of a delay between this episode and the last one. so. I remember now that she's kind of given the gist of what happened. Yeah, I think Kirkman was really, Robert Kirkman, the author, in case you didn't know, uh, it was really trying to draw out the reveals in the comic. Whereas when you make a show, as ambitious as this show is, you really want to make more cinematic moments. So the car, obviously, things like that, you know, the those those action-y moments are obviously why it's different. And mm-hmm. it makes sense to me. And... I, I kind of like Rick and Glenn at that point are two of my favorite characters, I think. So it's fun to see them, just purely them, and not have to deal with the whines or the racism or any of that other stuff. So, Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Lainey on at Zany Lainey or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time, geek out.